Welcome, and thank you everyone for joining us today. This session title is the SDGs and Sustainable Procurement, Les ODD et les achats responsables, Mainstreaming Sustainable Development Practices into the private and public sector requires both top-down and bottom-up approaches. This session will explore how employee entrepreneurship can support change from the grassroots and how procurement policies can be optimized to create business and supply chains that align with the SDGs. The speakers in our session today are Bob Willard, Spokesperson, 2020 Barometer on Sustainable Procurement, Anne-Marie Saulnier, Directrice Espace de Consultation sur les pratiques d'approvisionnement responsable ECPAR. Elle va présenter en français. She will be presenting in French, but is bilingual. Jane Zhang, co-founder and CEO and COO Edge Sourcing. And I'm Eric Sarvala, Strategic Account Executive, CSR, Employee Engagement and Foundation Solutions at BlackBot Canada in your cause. And I'm also an associate of CBSR, Canadian Business for Social Responsibility. I'll be speaking today about the SDGs and sustainable procurement from uh, individual entrepreneurship grassroots level and from a private sector lens. And I'll start at a high level with a sustainable supply chain management in Canada report that was done in 2018 that we produced at CBSR. We studied 52 companies and through that research identified some gaps in supply chain management. One was a financial risk assessment of supply chains, specifically measuring the financial risk of not pursuing a sustainable strategy. Another gap was a mismatch between procurement strategies, supplier codes of conduct, and providing support and training to suppliers that empowers them to meet the SDGs. We saw 11% of companies reporting on living wages, 58% reported on sustainable procurement, and 68% had a supplier code of conduct, while only 32% provided training and support to their suppliers. This impacts SDGs 8, 9, and 12 to start. Now, why is it important to address these gaps? Well, first we know that in August of 2019, the Business Roundtable redefined the purpose of a corporation. The new statement signed by the 181 CEOs committed to leading their companies for the benefit of all stakeholders. That included suppliers, as well as customers, employees, communities, and shareholders. Purpose is fundamentally about how that company marries business value with societal value. And then secondly, we're seeing in different reports how employees want to work for companies that are purposeful. In 2019, 2017, there was a, a Deloitte report that found millennials were increasingly sensitive to how their companies were addressing issues such as income equality, hunger, and the environment. And 88% of millennials believe that employers should play a vital role in alleviating these concerns. So this becomes a talent attraction management and development strategy, whether you are an SME or an enterprise organization. Employees are aligning their values to the companies that they work for. And companies with employee engagement programs within corporate social responsibility programs uh, are seeing, regardless of size, what that looks like from an ROI perspective when they activate those employees. Most recently, we're seeing volunteer entrepreneurship activities with employees leading COVID-19 relief activities, whether through virtual volunteerism or making PPE at home. These activities are connected to the SDGs. And during the pandemic, we're hearing we're all in this together. It's a similar sentiment with the SDGs and leave no one behind. Prior to the pandemic, these employees were taking part in climate strikes and engaging with social enterprises and nonprofit organizations in their communities, both on behalf of their company and following their personal passions. So how does this all relate to the SDGs and sustainable procurement? In my current role, I, I work with companies on their CSR and employee engagement programs by leveraging technology and technology that can help align and track to the SDGs. And in our 2019 industry review, we reported on the nonprofit declarations of our corporate clients and their employees engaged with each SDG. And just one example, we saw with SDG 4, 136,000 hours were volunteered in that year at a nonprofit advancing that SDG with over $15 million in associated donations. Many of these nonprofits offer a service that can be utilized by a company in their supply chain. 
One example is an environmentally friendly delivery service employing people from the neurodiverse community in Toronto. They deliver on food and via public transit, creating employment opportunities for people who are differently abled. They are a social enterprise and a registered charity. Employees that have the opportunity to volunteer with this type of organization can align the activity to the SDGs and then the company can leverage the social enterprise in their supply chain. At a grassroots level, corporate employees through volunteer engagements are contributing to sustainable procurement opportunities. One that their company can then engage with as well as other companies in the community and align it to the company's SDG goals. This is just one example of a transformational partnership between a company and community partner engaging in sustainable procurement where you can advance the SDGs together. Now I'll come back to one gap I mentioned earlier in the CBSR sustainable supply chain report and companies not measuring the financial risk of not pursuing a sustainable strategy. Companies need to measure this financial risk, which includes not aligning to the SDGs because as sustainable public procurement initiatives are developed, which my colleagues are gonna to speak to next, there's an opportunity for private sector companies, regardless of size, to leverage sustainable procurement and alignment to the SDGs and their downstream supply chain to qualify then as a government supplier upstream, which will lock, unlock new significant revenue sources while also operating purposefully and values aligned to their greatest resource and stakeholder their employees. I'm now pleased to call on Bob Willard to share his thoughts next. Thank you, Eric. And uh, thanks for that great introduction. That really sets up the pins for all of the things we're gonna be talking about. So uh, in my five minutes here, let me just give you a quick overview of, first of all, what sustainable procurement is for those that may be new to it. And then secondly, what this proposal is that uh, would help governments uh, encourage businesses of all sizes to be more engaged in the SDGs than they already are. Because as your survey indicated, the one that you mentioned at the beginning, uh, there's lots of opportunity <laughs> for businesses to be more engaged in the SDGs than they, they currently seem to be. So let's start with what sustainable procurement is. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. It basically means that what we're trying to do is ensure that we buy things, purchase things, procure things, uh, that are sustainable, sustainable products and services, and that we do that from companies that are more sustainable than others, so sustainable suppliers. So we're looking at two parts to this. Are the products sustainable? And when we talk about sustainable products, we're talking about uh, the usual suspects. Are they energy efficient? Uh, the waste associated with their packaging and the use of the product and their end of life disposition? Are they made from recycled products? Uh, do they emit carbon uh, dioxide or other greenhouse gases when they're being operated and so on. So there are a number of attributes of products uh, that are deemed to be preferable from a sustainability perspective, both, uh, both environmentally as well as socially as to where they come from and whether they're being generated in places that have responsible employment workplaces. So that's the product side. On the, on the supplier side, the company side, um, it's important that, that companies buy from organizations, companies that are practicing sustainable environmentally and social uh, preferable kinds of practices. In other words, they're being responsible. And a lot of the way in which we could tell whether they're doing that is whether they are contributing to the SDGs. So, there are two parts to it. Uh, sometimes those are weighted criteria, the attributes of the product and the attributes of the, of the supplier in the procurement tender. Sometimes they're not. The proposal that uh, we are uh, exploring right now is that governments, especially the federal government, which is signed on to the SDGs, make it a, uh, a prerequisite for any supplier that wants to do business with the federal government to simply disclose how they are doing on the SDGs, the extent to which they are contributing to the SDGs. Initially, we don't see it being a, a weighted criteria. We just like them to disclose how they're doing. Uh, and that would be a bit of a wake up call that these things matter. They matter to a customer, a customer called the federal government. So the federal government buys a lot of stuff. 
every year they spend about $20 billion on goods and services. Uh, so that's a significant buying power that they can exercise uh, as they uh, encourage companies to pay attention to these things. So the idea is that um, small and medium-sized enterprises as well as large companies would be required to disclose. And the SME community, as you know, is huge. In Canada, it's about 1.1 1 .1 million companies. It's 99.8% of the companies in Canada. They employ about 90% of the employees in the, in the country. So they're, they're huge, but they're extremely hard to connect with. Really, really hard to connect with. But this would be a real way to help them understand that uh, doing something useful on the environmental and social side, using the framework of the SDG to describe what those efforts look like uh, would be a, a excellent way for them to reassure themselves, the government and others uh, that they really do get it on the need for them to be more resilient companies and when we talk about resiliency, we're talking about how we get through this mess that we're in right now and end up with a system, a socioeconomic system, which is gonna be a better positioned to be able to weather additional challenges that are on the horizon. So it's a, a way to use the buying power of the federal government to engage companies in uh, being committed to helping to meet the SDGs that the government itself is committed to because it signed on to them five years ago and they do need help, SDG 17, uh, to partner with the business community in order to be able to achieve those goals by 2030. So that's a, a bit of a bird's eye view of how this would look and um, uh, we're happy to explore that more with you as we get to the Q&A session. Thanks so much, Bob. Much appreciated for uh, for those great thoughts. And yeah, thanks uh, for the, the framing of what sustainable procurement is. Uh, I'd like to, to welcome Anne-Marie and, uh, and your thoughts on, on this great topic. Merci beaucoup. Donc, peut-être je vais voir un peu si la traduction euh, démarre déjà, si ça va bien pour vous, pour m'entendre en anglais. Peut-être moi aussi. Oui, Bob. Mm. Excellent. Donc, euh, oui, je suis ici euh, pour vous parler d'achat responsable et peut-être pour vous parler euh, tout d'abord un peu de comment moi j'en suis venue à travailler cette question-là de l'achat responsable et à mobiliser euh, plusieurs organisations pour euh, unir leurs forces pour mettre en place euh, l'achat responsable. Donc, euh, il y a euh, maintenant 20 ans, en 1995, euh, pour euh, des études de deuxième cycle, j'avais voulu documenter l'impact des codes de conduite euh, des entreprises américaines comme Liz Claiborne, Reebok, Nike, euh, sur les conditions de travail dans des usines de sous-traitance en Amérique latine. Donc, j'étais avec une équipe de recherche, on est entré dans les usines, on est allé documenter les conditions de travail, le respect des lois environnementales de, du pays, c'était le Guatemala. Et avec les autres chercheurs, on a documenté que les codes de conduite qui étaient adoptés en Amérique du Nord, aux États-Unis, avaient un effet positif sur les lieux de production où euh, ils étaient euh, administrés par les compagnies et qu'ils aidaient les gouvernements de ces pays-là à faire respecter leurs propres lois sur leur territoire. Donc, euh, je suis rentrée au Québec après dix années de, de coopération internationale et de recherche de ce genre-là en 2005. Et euh, au Québec, on venait d'adopter une loi sur le développement durable dans laquelle il y avait exactement le libellé de l'objectif 12 des Nations unies qui est euh, produire et consommer de façon responsable. Donc, euh, les organisations du Québec, les, les administrations publiques avaient l'obligation de considérer cet objectif-là dans un plan de développement durable. Donc, c'était un extrêmement bon contexte pour promouvoir cette question-là d'achat responsable. Et euh, rapidement, on a mobilisé des organisations qui se sont associées pour unir leurs forces pour implanter l'achat responsable euh, sur leur chaîne d'approvisionnement. Et euh, j'en parle parce que c'était aussi euh, un objectif, dans le cadre de l'objectif 17, de mieux collaborer pour réussir à implanter ces objectifs-là parce qu'on voyait que les compagnies achetaient une grande quantité de produits et services où il y a des enjeux sur chaque catégorie et pour voir comment on peut acheter d'une façon plus responsable, c'était un défi immense. Donc, depuis donc, 2008, ces entreprises-là se sont réunies, des entreprises privées, des organisations publiques, des gouvernements, des municipalités, des OSBL. 
ont uni leurs forces et ont constitué une organisation qui s'appelle l'Espace de concertation sur les approvisionnements responsables. Et cette, cette organisation-là est celle aujourd'hui que je représente, où on a une trentaine de grands donneurs d'or du Québec et du Canada qui travaillent ensemble pour effectivement implanter le développement durable pour réussir, au fond, à atteindre des objectifs d'économie circulaire, de réduction euh, des émissions de GES sur les chaînes d'approvisionnement, mais aussi pour euh, voir comment on peut attaquer les dimensions sociales, euh, comment on peut euh, contrôler euh, mieux les, le respect des droits du travail sur les chaînes d'approvisionnement. Donc, euh, l'achat responsable, c'est la dimension environnementale, mais c'est aussi euh, tous ces objectifs-là du développement durable, de, 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 de moins de pauvreté, plus d'équité, plus d'entreprises dirigées par des femmes. Donc, nous, quand on analyse, au fond, l'ensemble des objectifs ou presque l'ensemble des objectifs de développement durable des Nations unies, on voit que les achats des organisations sont un levier immense pour pouvoir aider à les atteindre. Donc, c'est la vision qu'on a, qu sur laquelle on travaille depuis maintenant dix ans. Mais il y a beaucoup d'obstacles pour arriver à faire ça et c'est ce dont on pourra parler un peu tout à l'heure peut-être après cette présentation de comment on, on essaie d'arriver à implanter parce qu'on a une vision d'atteindre les objectifs des développements durables mais c'est comment on arrive à le faire vraiment. Pour le moment, on est encore beaucoup dans nos propres pratiques organisationnelles. Donc, on pourra en reparler peut-être au prochain tour. Bien, merci Anne-Marie. Uh, we really appreciated that. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will ask uh, Jane to provide us with your thoughts and perspectives. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Eric. And um, I will be delivering my content in English. However, I do have my co-founder on the line and we'll both be at the coffee afterwards and he will be able to speak French. So we welcome any sort of chats afterwards in both languages around this topic as it is a very near and dear topic to our hearts. So my name is Jane. I'm the co-founder of Edge Sourcing. We are a specialized firm in procurement, category management, and strategic sourcing. And as part of our firm, one of the core services that we've been really developing and offering out to the business is really around sustainable procurement. And this has come out of a love for both of our sides for the procurement functionality and how it really plays a role within the business to influence how businesses consume and the sustainability element of it. And we really founded everything around the UN SDGs because it is a set of global standards that everyone has aligned to that we all agree is absolutely critical that we achieve and hit and are hitting on those critical problems here in the world today. So I want to actually take a step back and talk about the sustainable the sustainability movement as a whole. And we've been undergoing a transformation as an entire global transformation in the consumer space for years now. And even five years ago, I think back to five years ago, I would walk into a cafe and the idea of a reusable straw or a reusable cup was just a completely foreign concept. And over the last years now, we've seen that sustainability movement transform. And we've seen that it works because it, when you change consumption pattern, that's when you change you know, those sustainability measures and you start to really impact sustainability at a much grander scale. Now, what I love about sustainable procurement is procurement is exactly how businesses consume. If you think about how, how do businesses consume and how do they spend their money, it is through their consumption pattern. And Emery, you hit it on the head earlier, there are so much consumption potential out there within these organizations, within companies, within public procurement, that if we can transform the way that businesses and large organizations consume, think about the amount of impact we could have on the SDGs on the world globally within the space to really drive home those goals that we're trying to achieve. So our sustainable procurement process was really born again out of that shared passion for the power of procurement and a love for sustainability. And we really see it as a bridge that connects those two groups together. So from all of the conversations that I've had with professionals in this space, someone always has one background or another. You know, they're either coming from a procurement background and for them, sustainability is a black box or they're coming from a sustainability background and they got all that fantastic expertise and procurement is the black box. And sustainable procurement is there as to act as a bridge to really connect the two together. Because what we found is when you look at how both of these organizations within the groups actually go about tackling challenges, solving problems, it's the exact same process. So the way I always say it um, with our clients is, uh, you know, sustainable, sustainable procurement is really just procurement with a little bit more green. 
You know, it's exactly what you do on your day to day, your seven steps of procurement that you know, like the back of your hand, but you add that a little bit of sustainability lens to it and your net impact is immense. And that means bringing in the UN SDGs as a sustainable measure and understanding what your goals are when it comes to sustainability, when you're doing your assessment, when you're building out your opportunities, when you're identifying opportunities within your organization for business value improvements, you're also going to be identifying those same opportunities for what is the sustainability opportunity? Can I tie these two opportunities together? And once you're able to do that, it makes your business case and your project and your program within the business so much more tangible and so much more easier to get support and buy-in from all levels of leadership to drive this initiative forward. Because one of the best examples we have is actually a circular economy example within um, consumer electronics. So there was an initiative where we worked with a client where we looked at how they were consuming consumer electronics and they had this equipment that was going out to every single consumer household where that equipment itself was being returned and then basically sent off to the recycling branch. So disposed. It was recycled. There was a recycling program but it was still disposed. And through an analysis of the business value, we realized that we could actually reuse those, those pieces of equipment. We just need to set up a refurbish, refurbishment station. So there was a program that was kicked off to set off this refurbishment station. And from there, that's your circular economy example where you're actually using and consuming now in a very responsible manner, in a very intellectual manner as well. So not only are you driving cost savings, which were huge as far as the project was concerned, you're actually also driving your waste reduction impact and your um, consumption impact. So there's this connection between the two that brought this project to life and was really able to turn around this project in a very quick manner. And the other thing that I love about sustainable procurement is it's not as hard as people think that it is. And I think there's a lot of myths out there that um, exist when it comes to sustainable procurement that people think, you know, you really need to be an expert or you, it takes a lot of cost or it takes a lot of time to start to integrate, you know, all these sustainability practices into like procurement. It actually doesn't. When you take your entire procurement process and you just add that little bit of green lens to it, it actually doesn't add that much cost, doesn't require a high level of expertise because there's so many amazing tools out there. And it actually doesn't add that much time. It takes this exact same amount of time that your procurement process would take, but your impact at the end is not just limited to your business value impact. It's actually limited, it actually includes your sustainability impact as well. And that is something that we are super proud of as an organization to be offering to the business and we're super proud to be helping various organizations to be doing. And it's something that we really like to talk about. And, you know, I could go on the topic for days and months, but, you know, I've been told I only have five minutes, so we have to keep this limited. But I'm happy to talk about you know, how you can be applying these practices in your day to day activity, because it is so easy and so simple to do. And just by integrating the UN SDGs as a driver instead of just a measure, you start to really drive those opportunities and really drive that, that impact at the end of the day. So with that being said, I will pass that back off to you, Eric. Thanks, Jane. It's, uh, this was great. What, what different perspectives everybody was bringing to this one conversation. It, uh, there's definitely multiple pieces of the puzzle that make up sustainable procurement. And I, I feel everybody was really able to bring what some of those pieces look like and hopefully we can fill in a, a few more throughout the, the Q&A portion of this. And uh, I, I do have a question for the, the panel to kick off uh, the Q&A. What, what do you feel is the biggest barrier for the government to work with the private sector in this model? And for, for Anne-Marie, quel est le plus grand obstacle pour le gouvernement à travailler avec le secteur privé Model. So perhaps I'll start with you, Bob, and, uh, and then we'll move to Emery and Jane. Yeah, it's a great question. Why wouldn't they do it? Um, and it may be almost cultural. Um, it may be hesitancy by the government to be too um, pushy on this stuff uh, and to ask companies to disclose things that uh, may be perceived as being bureaucracy or red tape. In, in North America, there's a real mentality that the government should be small um, and the market should drive everything. And uh, you want to cut red tape and all of that kind of rhetoric. Uh, I think that if we were to introduce 
a requirement that suppliers disclose how they're doing on the SDGs. Um, it might be uh, requiring more courage than a government would normally have to be able to, to do that. Having said that, we are at a particular pivot point right now in what's going on in the socioeconomic system. It's not working. Uh, the crises that we're going through right now have revealed all of the fault lines and it's very, very clear that we start to um, click into a different gear when things aren't working very well. Not the least of which is our dependence on government for help. So the role of government is expected to be more dominant when we're going through a crisis. They are expected to bail us out, to help us recover, to help us position ourselves so that we're more shock absorbent as we go into the future. And um, I think for businesses that want to get government help, uh, it's kind of important that they show that they are doing the kinds of things that government want other businesses to do as well. In other words, maybe there's a screen here that can be applied to those, those businesses that says, say, uh, how sustainable are you? Are you a resilient company? Because we're trying to build an economy out of resilient companies. And uh, before we uh, throw money at you to keep you alive, uh, it'd be kind of nice to reassure ourselves that you're the kind of company we want to keep alive. So as we start to get a little bit more uh, aggressive on uh, companies disclosing how they're doing thing on things that we care about, not the least of which are climate change and waste and circular economy and so on, I think governments are going to have the courage to be able to do this um, because they want to structure uh, and help us transform and transition to uh, a different socioeconomic system because it's very clear that the one that we're in now doesn't work. Yeah, those are those are great thoughts. Thank you, uh, Anne Marie. De mon côté, pour répondre à cette question, est-ce que les gouvernements, est-ce qu'il y a vraiment des barrières pour que les gouvernements travaillent avec le secteur privé sur la question d'achat responsable? Moi, je ne crois pas qu'il y a tellement de barrières comme ça. Je pense que les, les barrières sont surtout culturelles. Peut-être que les gouvernements, ont, surtout en Amérique du Nord, que, quelles sont les voies qu'un gouvernement pourrait prendre pour travailler avec le secteur privé sur ce plan-là? Il pourrait développer des politiques publiques qui exigent, au fond, que les entreprises privées implantent l'achat responsable comme ça existe en Europe. Et il y a un effet d'entraînement définitivement sur ce plan-là. Ou il pourrait financer l'implantation, donc financer des groupes un peu comme nous, l'ECPAR, qui avons le rôle d'implanter. Donc ça, ça pourrait être une autre voie ou utiliser leur pouvoir d'influence via leurs propres acquisitions pour avoir des exigences pour que leurs fournisseurs, comme Bob disait, performent mieux et arrivent à mieux performer sans une exigence de leur marché. Moi, je dirais que c'est les trois leviers par lesquels les gouvernements pourraient le faire. Et pour les trois, il y a un certain nombre d'obstacles. Euh, culturelle, l'Amérique du Nord, où les gouvernements adoptent très peu des politiques publiques pour exiger une responsabilité d'entreprise de la part de l'entreprise privée. Ça, c'est un fait. Euh, au niveau du, du financement de ces organisations-là, à une certaine époque, nous, on a fait un repérage. Est-ce que dans certains pays du monde, on, les gouvernements financent pour que des groupes appuient la mise en place de l'achat responsable sur un territoire? Moi, je n'ai rien trouvé. Je ne sais pas si vous, vous avez repéré, mais il n'y a pas tant d'expérience comme ça. Et donc, ça, c'est un bout. Et sinon, de l'implanter via ces acquisitions, nous, ce qu'on a observé, c'est que les gouvernements et les entreprises privées implantent l'achat responsable, surtout jusqu'à 2020, via la performance des produits, dont les attributs des produits dont on parlait Bob, mais on demande très peu la performance des fournisseurs. Donc, on va demander d'avoir un produit plus performant sur le plan énergétique, un produit qui contient la matière recyclée, qui n'a pas de composé organique volatile. Ça, oui, il y a des pratiques comme celle-là, mais demander que le secteur privé, les fournisseurs, aient une meilleure performance de leur gestion de matière résiduelle, réduisent leurs émissions de GES ou à ceux que leur matériel suit la courbe circulaire via la disposition et la réintroduction de matière c'est encore très, très peu. Mais je pense qu'il faut forcer ces choses-là, et surtout dans le contexte de l'après-COVID, 
Euh, il faut voir comment on peut arriver à faire à faciliter cette collaboration-là et implanter ces mécanismes-là. On a un moment clé, je pense, pour le faire. Et aussi pour regarder comment les accords de libre-échange euh, imposent des limitations psychologiques ou réelles aux acheteurs d'implanter l'achat responsable. Great, thank you. And uh, a few of those points, it, it made me think of another question that I'll hold for now, uh, based on your comments and what Bob said, and we'd love to hear from Jane on this. Absolutely. So everything um, Bob and Emery touched on, you know, the cultural influences, the regulatory pieces, those are all absolutely critical. One thing that I think is really important for governments to realize is that not all suppliers are cut from the same cloth, right? And I think that's the same case in the private sector as well. Not all your suppliers are going to be cut from the same cloth. You might have, and it's a very circular uh, two-way communication that you need to have with, with your suppliers. So you might have suppliers like HP who have amazing sustainability practices, who are really industry-leading, forefront, cut, like leading-edge sustainability practices where they can actually help the government adopt a lot of those sustainable procurement practices and help them look at their sustainability practices. But you might also have those smaller suppliers who, if you just go to them and you just say, hey, tell me your SDG impact, the smaller supplier might be sitting there going, I don't even know what an SDG is. I think I've heard about this once in a while. It was maybe on some sort of publication. There's all this buzz around sustainability, but I don't know, what, where am I supposed to start, right? And I think it's that recognizing that this is a two-way communication channel that we need to have. We need to be learning from those who are stronger than us in certain areas, and we need to be sharing what we know really well, what we're very, very good at within government and applying that and sharing that with those suppliers because sometimes it's not a matter of the supplier doesn't want to be more sustainable it's a, it's a matter of the supplier doesn't know how and hasn't really been given direction of saying if you do these four things you're going to be making progress on the path to becoming a more sustainable supplier for us to becoming a better supplier for the public sector for the private sector and to be helping your business and it's really about supplier performance management and supplier relationship management in that case you're developing out your suppliers so i think that's going to be one of the biggest barriers and challenges is really recognizing that you have suppliers across this entire spectrum and how do you address and how do you connect with them on, at different points Eric, could I just make two quick points? Uh, yeah, building, on, building on what Jane and Anne Marie just mentioned. Uh, I think there's a, a leadership opportunity here for the federal government. If they can come up with a system that works at their level on sustainable public procurement, which uses the SDG lens on what that looks like, if they can do that, then that can be cascaded down to the provincial level and to the municipal level. It's the same stuff. It's just being used at, at different levels in the public sector. And if we can do that in Canada, then there's a leadership opportunity for the, for the country in the United Nations, because there's no reason why that same system could not be um, shared with the other 193 states that signed on for this in 2015 at the UN. So there's a huge leadership opportunity. The second part is what Jane was talking about in terms of tools that make it a reasonable request that companies disclose how they're doing on this. And uh, I think we're much better positioned today than we used to be on those things. There's the SDG action manager, there's the Ecovata stuff that, that looks at uh, how suppliers are, are rated on some of these attributes. There are other tools that we're developing as well. So I don't think there's any excuse anymore for not doing this. We're ready. Yes, Anne-Marie. Je voudrais peut-être compléter un point sur ce que j'ai dit, ce que Bob est en train de dire maintenant. C'est euh, il faut savoir aussi qu'en ce moment, euh, Service public approvisionnement Canada collabore avec le secteur privé et d'autres partenaires, sont membres de l'ECPAR, l'espace de concertation sur les pratiques d'approvisionnement responsable dont je suis responsable. Ils sont là depuis maintenant euh, près de dix ans. Là. Et ils sont extrêmement actifs en matière d'achat responsable. Donc, souvent, c'est aussi extrêmement compliqué pour les gouvernements d'arriver à communiquer vraiment les, tout, toutes les démarches qu'ils font là, pour euh, réussir à faire savoir. Donc, je pense que sur ce plan-là, le gouvernement du Canada est quand même très actif. Et euh, nous, entre autres, on a eu un appui financier là, du gouvernement du Canada pour travailler un baromètre de l'approvisionnement responsable dont je vais reparler tout à l'heure. 
et au fond qui vise là, à prendre le pouls de où en sont les organisations en matière d'achat responsable et comment elles contribuent aux objectifs de développement durable des Nations unies. Donc, euh, on peut dire qu'il y a quand même aussi un changement dans les dernières années où on, vra on voit vraiment une volonté d'avancer sur ce dossier-là. Moi, je le, je le sens très, très bien. Là. Je voulais être certaine de l'avoir mentionné. <laughs> Merci. Uh, I'm bringing forward uh, one of the questions that have been uh, submitted. Uh, what are the three biggest gaps in the current federal procurement policy? How can we encourage policy makers to add another layer, read the SDGs, in what is already a red tape heavy environment? <laughs> <laughs> Based on Bob's laugh, uh, is this something you want to field first? <laughs> yeah. When did you stop beating your wife? Um, so uh, the uh, the challenge is the perception of, of what we're asking the federal government to do. And let me just build on what Anne Marie said. They're doing a lot already. I mean, they really are doing some good things on um, the climate file, the climate change file, greenhouse gases, carbon, all of those kinds of things and asking their vendors to be more uh, forthcoming on how they're doing on, on those kinds of things. So, you know, what we're asking them to do is not put another layer on top, it's to expand those kinds of things in a reasonable way so that they have a better sense of which companies are on the same page that they are. I mean, if the federal government's trying to reach these SDGs, there's no way they can do it without help from the business community. So they want to do business with companies that are are contributing to the same things that they're trying to contribute to, which is those goals by 2030. So basically it's a fairly reasonable request that, that, that they ask companies to give them a sense of uh, whether they are interested in the same things the federal government is, because the federal government wants to do business with companies that are interested in the same things they are. Are there any friggin' questions? I mean, th this is, it's, it's time for them to be very straightforward on this. And why do they care about those things? Not just because they signed on to them, because those SDGs are foundational for the kind of socioeconomic system that we have to get to. Because they're not there today and we are, we are experiencing what it's like when they're not there today. We need a more resilient society, a more resilient economy, a more resilient socioeconomic system. And the attributes of that system are defined by the SDGs. So we need organizations that are actively attempting to re-swizzle uh, re their business models so that they are able to uh, reach some of those goals for their own self-serving purposes. So this is not a sacrifice we're asking them to make. The business case for being more sustainable is well proven. I've spent 20 years making that case. Uh, so can you make more money? Yes. Can you avoid a lot of risk? Absolutely. Can you engage your employees? You bet. So all of those things are there. So all we have to do is, is get companies to understand that we're trying to help them help themselves. Uh, Jane, I see you smiling and nodding a lot. Uh, do you want to add to that? Uh, it's always uh, it's always great when I hear Bob speak so passionately about the SDGs. So, <laughs> Agreed. We, Agreed. We were on a panel together very recently, actually, and we, I know it's a shared passion of ours. Um, it's fantastic that, and I, I want to really drive home that point around resiliency. It's really, you know, these companies need to be resilient, and they need to adopt the SDGs in and really contribute to them in a meaningful way in order to keep that resiliency and to contribute to that greater future that we're all aiming towards adopting. And I think one of the biggest challenges in the public, not just the public sector, but I think in general when it comes to sustainable procurement is changing the way people think about how you adapt sustainability, how you adopt the UN SDGs. It's not that we're going to add additional measure. It's not that we're going to add additional process and additional oh, um, element of, you know, you, there's your RFP and then your supplier qualification. Then here we're going to add an SDG qualification step and now we're going to make the entire process longer. That's not the case at all. All we're saying is take your existing procurement practice and then add a little bit more of that green element, add a little bit more of that SDG element into that mix. And that's how you're gonna transform how people go about structuring their projects, how about they go about structuring their opportunities. It, one of the best examples I like to give in this space is, you know, when you look at call center outsourcing, 
And you think about organizations with huge call centers, governments have huge call centers. And that's always a high risk element of saying, okay, this is a direct line to my organization's reputation out to the public. So I don't necessarily want to outsource that entire piece to a smaller organization or to an organization where, you know, they might be doing great things in terms of job creation in an at-risk or in an at-risk country, but I don't know whether or not that that supplier is going to be sustainable. So if you bring a supplier like that into an opportunity of that space where you're outsourcing your entire call center, there's no way they can compete on the same level. They just can't. They're going to get eliminated right away. But if you look at your opportunity and you really take that sustainability lens and you really think hard to yourself about, here's my entire call center outsourcing. Which is the small little piece of it that actually is a low risk element? And can I carve that out and put that out as a separate opportunity and make that available to those organizations? So then now they're all competing on the same level playing field. That's the mentality shift that needs to happen when we think about sustainable procurement. That's what needs to change when it comes to how governments apply sustainable procurement in their day-to-day -day practice, not just governments, but all organizations. Um, we're not saying, you know, add 5,001 additional elements to measure. It's think about how you're structuring, even at the onset, at your assessment level, at your opportunity identification level. Think about it from that lens and that angle, and that's going to make your life much easier down the line when you get through to the contracting phase and to the award phase with your suppliers. Great. Thank you. Uh, I had a, a follow-up question uh, here for Bob, and uh, understanding the, the broad message you're delivering, what might that look like uh, operationalized when the, the PSPC and Government of Canada is making procurement decisions? How should SDG contributions weigh in against value for money, et cetera? What might the rubric look like? Yeah, uh, initially, I think we have to make it really, really simple. Simple for the PSPC folks, the folks that are responsible for procurement, for procurement at the federal level, as well as for the respondents, the suppliers themselves. So initially, it would be basically just require uh, suppliers to qualify as a potent, potential vendor by disclosing their scores on the SDGs, how they're doing on the SDGs. Whether, they, whether the government uh, rates them on their score is uh, not on the table. It's just, just disclose how, how you're doing on, on the SDGs. Maybe a couple of years down the road, they can start um, using that as a weighted criteria, but initially just to be fair to uh, the suppliers as a wake up call, uh, just ask them to disclose how they're doing. So that, that from a procurer point of view, it's fairly straightforward. On the other hand, from a supplier point of view, it's a simple question, but it's a tough answer. Like how the heck do you make that self-assessment? Um, and there are various tools out there that, that help them do that, including uh, the SDG Action Manager from B Corp that you mentioned before. Um, there's uh, the scoring that's done by EcoVadis. There's another tool that, uh, that we've just created, which is on my website that may be helpful as well. There are various ways that, that organizations can do that. So it behooves us to be able to help them uh, make that disclosure in a way that works for both themselves as well as others. Um, so I, I think it's, it's quite doable initially. The, as you get into it a little bit further, then you need to be able to um, help the, the procurement folks do a better job of taking a look at, at the scores in detail and making sure that the ones that they think are more important to the federal government than others, like the ones on climate change, are weighted appropriately and that the scores that are given to a, to a supplier are more than the current approach, which is a ticky mark for, you know, are you a sustainable company? Yes or no? Well, absolutely, yes, we are. Uh, and then you move on. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, so I, I think what we can do is expand this criteria to the point where uh, we are helping companies help themselves by becoming more sustainable in order to qualify for some of their biggest customers. And by the way, if this system works in the public sector, it can work in the private sector. So large companies um, can also take advantage of this when they are screening their suppliers for how sustainable they are. And in fact, Walmart and, and P&G have already done this years ago 
in terms of the 15 question questionnaire that Walmart sent out to all of their suppliers in 2005 and the 12 question questionnaire that P&G sent out to all of their suppliers in 2006. Um, so, you know, this is not strange territory for large companies. And frankly, if large companies can do this, I don't know why a government couldn't. Thanks, Bob. And Marie. Oui, ben peut-être je voulais ajouter sur euh, ce que mentionnait euh, Bob euh, pour euh, que euh, PSPC implante des critères qui vont viser à rencontrer <rire> les objectifs de, de développement durable. Euh, il faut, euh, comme n'importe quel objectif qu'on voudrait qu'une équipe rencontre, il faut qu'ils aient les employés, les acheteurs, les gestionnaires qui sont responsables des équipes qui achètent dans leurs objectifs d'intégrer les objectifs de développement durable ou des critères d'acquisition qui vont faire en sorte qu'on rencontre les ODD, il faut que ce soit dans leurs objectifs et qu'ils soient évalués sur ça. Je pense que c'est un moyen. Donc, soit il y a une règle qui dit à chaque fois qu'on achète du mobilier de bureau, il faut absolument exiger tel critère parce qu'on sait que le marché est en mesure de le proposer. Ou soit il faut que les gens soient récompensés, valorisés s'ils font dans le cadre de leur travail. Donc, en ce moment, il y a des stratégies au gouvernement du Canada. Il y a des critères qui sont recommandés, mais il n'y a pas d'incitatif et il n'y a pas de suivi qui fait en sorte qu'on suit que les personnes le font. Donc, il faut prendre la locomotive où elle est. Là. Il faudrait vraiment qu'on fasse arriver à un niveau supérieur, soit des critères mandataires pour des achats, et que les gens soient valorisés s'ils ont vraiment réussi à implanter ces, ces critères-là. Et qu'on comprenne mieux où est le marché. Qu'est-ce que les fournisseurs sont capables de proposer aussi? Où ils en sont dans leur offre plus durable? Ça, il y a un gap entre ce que les acheteurs savent et ce que le marché peut leur proposer. Et souvent, les marchés publics, les acheteurs publics n'ont pas le droit de parler avec les fournisseurs. C'est ces deux mondes-là. Donc, est-ce qu'on peut rapprocher ces deux mondes-là sans qu'il y ait de danger d'éthique de, ou ces questions-là? Ça, ce serait un autre moyen qui nous permettrait de, de franchir des pas. Yes, Jane. So, actually, that's a great point that Emery brought up. You absolutely need to integrate the criteria of evaluation and actually really integrate sustainability evaluation into your criteria. And I think the other thing that, you know, organizations need to understand is you don't have to have all 17 in every single set of criteria. Not every category is going to hit all 17 SDGs in terms of impact. Each different category is going to have its own opportunities. And when it comes to sustainability opportunities, one category might really tackle one or two different SDGs really well. Make sure you're tailoring and you're not taking a one brush stroke for all of your categories and all of your opportunities. Make sure you're really tailoring those types of criteria that you're going to be measuring your suppliers on. And that allows them to respond more intelligently to what you're asking. That's great. And I, I wanted to follow up on a, a couple of things that, that Anne-Marie said and, uh, and Bob. First, uh, Anne-Marie, you were talking about the cultural differences that, that can exist. And now you just, you just mentioned about um, trying to bring two worlds together that are, aren't typically together. And Bob, you mentioned the federal procurement, but then provincial and municipal. And recognizing there's some amazing work being done provincially. We, we see it in Quebec with, with Anne-Marie and Ekbar leading this. We see it in British Columbia. There's some great work uh, happening in pockets in Ontario. Uh, I'm sure Jane is leading some of this in Alberta. Recognizing the federal government represents actually a small percentage of public procurement in Canada. And it's really the provincial and municipal governments that have the larger, or larger percentage. How does the federal government lead in this position, especially when some of the provinces might be a little bit farther ahead in their thinking? Go ahead, Anne-Marie. <laughs> and, and I think we've lost our interpreter, so you can speak either language. It's up to you. No, but let's go, Bob. I'm going to go after. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, Yeah, I totally agree. When I was talking about leadership, I wasn't talking about leadership in terms of the volume that they have, because you're quite right. The, the federal part of the public sector procurement in Canada is actually quite small. They spend about $20 billion, but there are $200 billion that are being spent across the public, all the public sectors in Canada. So there's a huge, huge buying power that we can exercise there. So when I was referring to the federal leadership, it was the... Um, 
the funding of the systems and processes and tools that are required as a part of this. The kinds of things that, that Jane and Anne-Marie were just talking about. You need to have a, a structured way of, of um, building this into the processes that you already are using and doing it in a way that uh, builds on a, a base of experience and competence um, that you can tweak and add to in order to introduce sustainable criteria into it. So what I was saying, leadership, it was, it can be from, it could be from the municipalities. I mean, if FCM wanted to get into this as well and come up with a, a system at the municipal level, that'd be, that'd be super as well. Or if there is a coalition of, of provincial governments that want to do it, that's fantastic. But what we want to avoid is everybody reinventing the same wheel. I mean, if we want to do this, let's get our act together and, and do it in a way that's going to be able to be shared with other people. There's no value to, to kind of hoarding it. Uh, and, and let's invest in uh, an effort which is going to shake down the system so that it can be cloned in other jurisdictions. So it, it's not a, an either or. It, it, it's just let's be smart about the limited resources we've got and be able to, to really leverage them so that everybody can benefit from them. Agreed. Uh, Anne Marie. Yes, well, I were about to say that uh, maybe we have a small proposal that uh, we have done about that, that uh, tomorrow at 12.30, uh, we're going to have the launch of um, a survey we are doing each four years. This is uh, the Sustainable Purchasing Barometer 2020. And this barometer will be realized all over Canada. We have four partners uh, um, all around Canada. So we have CBSR based in Alberta, but I think with some members all over Canada, it's more than nothing the private sector. We have a Canadian uh, CCSP, Canadian Coalition for Sustainable Procurement. Uh, this is a municipality organized uh, network and they are all over Canada too. We have a Recycling Council of Ontario. They are based in Ontario, working with so many municipalities. And uh, we have the OPBA. This is an association of buyers. So we all together are working together to make this survey to get at least 200 respondents to answer to a survey on sustainable procurement. And our sustainable procurement is, is permitting to reach the SDG. So when we're gonna have the result of that, all the group, we want to work together and we invite you, Jane and Eric and Bob, to work with us to analyze those, uh, those results. And we will propose something to try to work together on sustainable procurement, because as you were saying, we cannot continue to work each one on our side. We should try to see how we can work together to reach something concrete about that. And I think it could be something we can try to do together. And all the person listening to us right now, they can communicate with us or participate tomorrow. I think our activity is present on the program of Together Ensemble. So be there and you can see how you can maybe participate in the campaign. So we have to get sustainable purchasing in the, in the head of everybody, thinking about how they can do with their buying to help to, 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 to get those SDG put in place. So I think uh, this is something I am proposing now. Yeah, that's uh, such an amazing initiative. And the, uh, the data that's going to come back from that is really going to be able to figure out where we are from a, a barometer standpoint and where how we're going to be able to move the needle and what we need to do going forward yes exactly this is the the target the objective yep looking forward to that thank you we, we had a question come in for uh, for uh, for jane how much value does outsourcing carry when it comes to using SDGs throughout its procurement process? If they do have any knowledge on it at all, because some developing nations seem to lack uh, knowledge on it. Oh, it's interesting about this and this question. Um, I really like it actually, it's a great question. Um, when it comes to you know the SDGs and for people who are in the industry who understand sustainable procurement, who understand the SDGs, we say the SDGs and it clicks for us. We know what that means. We know what the measures are. We know what the context is. And again, I go back to that point, your suppliers are on a spectrum of maturity. So a lot of the times when we're looking at integrating these elements of assessment, it's almost like you have to be very 
thoughtful in your process when you're structuring out the questions that you're asking your suppliers because you have to think about it from the angle of how do I make this easy for my suppliers to respond to when I ask them a question just like how when we write RFPs you know you're thinking how do I make my requirements something easy that my resp suppliers are can respond to you should also also make your sustainability requirements something easy for them to respond to so in that example where um, I was talking about the call center um, one thing with outsourcing is you know, you look at fair employment and equal employment opportunities, right? How do you structure your questions so that you're ultimately getting towards measures that you can put towards measuring that SDG without actually saying, oh, please tell me how you're going to contribute to, to SDG equal, equal employment. If you put it out like that, your suppliers are going to struggle. So you almost have to take a very intellectual approach to say, what are the measures that I think this opportunity can respond to and how do I structure the questions that I'm going to be asking to quantify the impact of that measure in a way that's digestible for my suppliers that they don't have to be SDG experts to be able to respond to. Thanks, Jane. Uh, I see we have uh, just a few more minutes here. Uh, oh, I thought there was uh, one more question. Yeah, and this is a great question. Maybe just one of you might be able to answer this. Is there a way to identify companies and organizations who are already applying SDG principles, whether they know it or not? Yeah, it may depend whether you're talking about applying the principles to sustainable procurement, to procurement, or whether the company in general. Um, as Anne Marie said, the barometer is going to help us with the. Uh, uh, understanding which companies are already using it in the sustainable procurement arena. Um, at a company level, uh, there are some fairly good ratings and rankings of companies as to how sustainable they are. They don't use necessarily the SD, SDG language, but it's how sustainable they are. Corporate Knights has a great uh, rating and ranking that they do every year of large companies, the Global 100. Um, but at the SME level, not so much. Uh, they're a very amorphous group, and we really don't have good, um, at least to my knowledge, good ways of uh, doing sort of a bird's eye view of what's moving and shaking in that community because they're so diverse and hard to get a handle on. And they don't have to disclose information. Large publicly traded companies are required to disclose information because they're publicly traded. So there's the data on which we can rate and rank them. Uh, smaller companies, in many cases, private, they're privately owned, so there's no data, so we can't rank them. So we don't know um, how they are doing on the issues that uh, sustainability slash SDGs care about. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I think that's it uh, for time. So we would love to thank Jane and Marie, Bob, for your thoughts and perspectives today and examples. Uh, I, I feel like we really took one, one step forward in terms of framing this and, and giving some practical tools that people were are able to walk away from and some great uh, resources and, and links in the, uh, in the chat as well that people can leverage going forward. So look forward to the launch tomorrow, Anne-Marie. And uh, yeah, please, if uh, everybody on the call is able to participate, uh, would love to have uh, involvement in that. And thank you for joining the SDGs and Sustainable Procurement Session today. Thank, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric.